It is Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. This is another playoff edition of Baseball Today presented to you by SeatGeek. That is my man, Trevor Fluke. I am Chris Rose, producer Dan, along for the ride as well. You're looking cool. You feeling good? <laughs> no, that does not That does not look cool. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. You know what is cool? We could save you money if you download the SeatGeek app today and you use the code word John Boy Postseason, all caps, all one word. You're going to save 10% on your next purchase, whether you're a returning customer or a newbie. Go use them on the World, World Series tickets, NFL, college football, NBA's getting started tonight, NHL concert goers. Save 10% with the code word John Boy Postseason. All right. Well, the postseason will continue for the Texas Rangers. They are World Series bound for the first time. In a dozen years, they continue to be road warriors. They take down the champs in seven, thanks to the man who was right in the middle of the entire series. Garcia starts the third and drives one the other way down the line. If it's fair, he's got another. He does. Adolis Garcia owning October. Grounded a second. Two years removed from losing a hundred. Came in here against all odds. You went to Tampa. You went to Baltimore. I can't say I've ever seen a club that played with more heart. So thanks, and I'm going to add this. Congrats on wearing the horns in Texas and going to the World Series. Very cool stuff for Bruce Bochy. Adolis Garcia obviously named your ALCS MVP. If I had told you a month ago the Texas Rangers were going to the World Series, you would have said, I could see it if they get hot. And they did. Their offense has been scorching hot. You got the guys, you got your main guys doing it for you. Uh, they got good starts uh, from their starting pitching. Uh, the bullpen actually held up, which has been probably the most surprising thing of all of this. But yeah, I think I would have said I could see it because of what their offense was uh, shown to be capable of during the regular season. They've carried that over and then some, I believe, um, into the postseason. But, you know, it. I think that's the main reason, but it's not the only reason. I mean, they've been playing some really good defense. The emergence of Evan Carter, I think, is a massive part mm -hmm. of this. Uh, he's just given them, you know, additional length in the lineup that was already so, so long. So, um, yeah, I mean, you definitely could see it. They they had the ability to do it. They they had the, the makings of, like, what the Phillies looked like last year as they went through the postseason. So, I think with that in mind, yeah, I would have said I, I could see it. I didn't. I'll be the first one to raise yeah. my hand and said, no way. I mean, in in late September, when they had that road trip to finish the season, I think they first went to Anaheim, which obviously wasn't a problem. Then they were going to finish with four in Seattle after having just played the Mariners and taken it to the Mariners in Arlington, a series where I gave Seattle the pep talk of all pep talks. Boy, did I really hammer that one. God, I nailed it, huh? And uh, so Texas ends up squeaking into the playoffs. They did maybe miss an opportunity to get home field advantage and make Houston, Houston play in the wild card round. Did not happen. Instead, they had to get on a five and a half hour flight to Tampa to go play a dominant team. They laughed in their face. They went to Baltimore, which was sitting home after a bye. They laughed in their face. They took it to Houston the first two games. And then the ultimate gut punch of all gut punches to be leading in game five and to be able to have to just win one in Houston. And Jose Altuve did that to him. I thought there was no way they were going to recover from that. No way. And they did, dude. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about home field advantage. I've, I've talked about home field advantage in Houston for so long, how it just seems mm -hmm. like, it's, like it's very difficult to go play there. It, it wasn't this year. All year long, they had a losing record at home. Then during the playoffs, they didn't look good at home. They lost every single game of this series at home. Uh, it, it was interesting how it played out. Um, but yeah, you have to give, you know, a tip of the cap to the Rangers for, you know, facing that adversity that you're right. That game five could have ended them. Instead, they go in back to Houston and win two in a row. And uh, yeah, it's, it's I mean, Montgomery has to be mentioned in this coming in and, and, and doing what he did last night, like sort of I, I mentioned this on Talking Baseball, you know, Mad Bum texted Bruce Bochy yeah. before the game saying, hey, if you need me for game seven, that's what that's Monty did the same thing. You know, a couple couple dudes who are, you know, country boys who don't care, who have a slow heartbeat coming into the game on their on their on their throw day. 
And what did Monty put up? Two and a third innings? Dude, That's amazing. So it was interesting. The entire season, who were the pitchers we talked about? Jacob deGrom, obviously Max in the Scherzer. beginning, <laughs> and Max Scherzer. Yeah. And Scherzer, okay, he started game seven, but boy, they, they whisked him out of there pretty quickly. And the two guys who you were like, okay, they've been good. Nathan Avaldi, who is now turned into a postseason legend. There's no other way to to paint this thing. He has he's not just going to be known as the guy who pitched nine innings out of the bullpen for the Boston Red Sox. As remarkable as that was in the 2018 World Series and his feat that should never be forgotten. This is the dude you want on the mound. And it was gate, you know, it could have gone sideways in game six, particularly in the first inning where he gave up a run. That did not happen, and he pitched into the seventh. And he gave this team the confidence to say, hey, you know what? We can continue to win here in Houston. And it's exactly what they did. Yeah, it's, you know what? Like, we talk about clutch gene and and all these things. I, I think the playoffs really are a separator. You really get to see, you know, who can control their emotions, who can take the additional, you know, energy, adrenaline, and kind of harness it and use it for good. Uh, I think that's a real skill. And, you know, one that I wish I would have been able to see it. Was I a guy that would have shied away from it or would I have, you know, taken it and ran with it? We'll never know, Chris. But Eovaldi and, and and some of these guys in the Rangers, they've harnessed it, man. They they have a really good energy uh, in this group right now. And, um, gosh, it's whoever they play in the World Series, it's going to be a tough match for them because that offense is just absolutely oh. unreal. Listen, if you make it to the World Series – you're playing good baseball. So whomever they play, whether it's the Phillies or the Diamondbacks, can say the same exact thing about be careful Rangers because we're just as hot. Uh, I want to mention something. Somebody that's joining us in the chat, Spicy So, says, I don't know why everybody judged them, meaning the Rangers, by their last month instead of their team the full year. Well, because that's what you do. You do it based on how they're playing at a given time. In 2021, the Braves didn't even take over first place to the month of August. They totally had a facelift of their franchise. They changed their outfield. They changed their bullpen, guys they could rely on. So you don't do it based on a whole year. You don't do it based on how they played in May. You do it based on how they were playing heading into the playoffs. And that's why you judge them based. That's the way certainly I looked at it. Some people might look at it differently. Quickly, Bruce Bochy. I didn't expect him to be uh, having a chance to lift the commissioner's trophy one year in to this venture. And I thought he was kind of nuts, to be honest with you, to come out of retirement and put his legacy on the line and all this sort of stuff. I know you're reluctant to give managers credit. How much does he deserve? That's not true, dude. I give managers credit in things they deserve credit for. I mean, they can't play on the field. You have to have good players. Uh, How much credit does he deserve? Uh, He deserves some credit. I mean, a lot of clubhouses go how their managers go. Like, you know, he's a steady force you know, I think that a voice like that, a guy who's not going to be so up and down, and like I said, is a very just kind of a steady guy, help them get through, you know, at the end of the season. You know, there was no panic. You know, yeah, they lost the division through a tiebreaker at the end of the year. They had to go to fly over Dallas to go to Tampa. They kept mentioning that. A guy like Bruce, you know, he'll just steady the clubhouse. And he understands he's been around a lot of teams. He knows when to be in the clubhouse, when to get out of the clubhouse, all those things. You know, I think we all owe the Texas Rangers an apology because Bochi comes out. We're like, what are you doing, bro? Like, you, mm-hmm. what's going on with this? Uh, DeGrom says he wants to leave New York because he wants to play for a World Series and see why he's building something great there. You see Seager and Simeon go there. We think, oh, it's just a money grab, dude. They went out and got the biggest paycheck. You know, what, what they're going to go rot away. Everything they've done is to get to here. And they did it. Everyone was right, except for all of us who doubted them. And that was me for sure. Still could be a money grab. Yeah. They could, but they, but you know, I they mean, could really, have money other, other places as well, but they got I, sold on Texas. They did, and it they wasn't just sold. a pipe dream. It, it wasn't, it didn't end up that way, but let's be honest. If you, you're going through and you're picking a team because you're like, yeah, I believe they're going to the world series. Come on. I think very I think, few people went, yeah, Jacob DeGrom, you're right. Wouldn't he, have, if he had taken the money from San Diego, if he had taken the money to stay with the Mets, if he had gone down to Atlanta, you would have been like, makes sense. 
he went to a team that hadn't made the playoffs since 2016. So you can't tell me that it ended up working out. They had a plan. They sold them on, and the plan worked. And yeah. that, I don't know. I guess that doesn't happen that often. They could have went other places. I don't remember who was in the race for Seager and for Simeon. I'm, you know, I'm sure a right, lot of people either. were in on their services. But, like, you know, th- again, a lot of the times people say stuff like that, and it blows up in their face, and we all kind of laugh and say, you know, what were you thinking, bro? Come on. Don't say stuff like that just to say it. This one came true. Certainly did. Certainly did. All right. Um. Now baseball is going to go almost a quarter century without a repeat champion. Astros made it close to another World Series appearance. Didn't get it. Alex Bregman? Definitely not what you what you want. You know, uh, when you set out in spring training, you set out to, to go win a championship. And um, unfortunately, we didn't. Um, you tip your hat to them. They played a heck of a series. They got a heck of a ball club over there. Why didn't it work out for them? They ran into a really good team. It doesn't. It did work out for them. They made it to Game Seven of the ALCS. Sometimes it's just ball. They ran into a good team and they got pummeled in Game Seven. I, I, I'm just not one of those guys that thinks like that's a bad season for the Astros. It's, it's not. I mean, they were on the doorstep of the World Series. Is it a disappointing ending to the season? Sure. Um, why did it? end that way for them why didn't it work out i mean there's a bunch of different reasons but there's no real good reason other than it's just baseball and the rangers took it to them the last game of their season that's it i mean when you go everything right if you had said that in game seven it would either be max scherzer who is making his second start in five weeks without any rehab starts against christian javier who has just been dominant as a postseason starter. Not good, not serviceable as the number three guy, flat-out dominant. Even going into last night's game, I was like, how are they going to get to Javier? And he doesn't make it out of the first inning. That was shocking. But if that happens in a game in July, we probably don't even talk about it the next day on Baseball Today. But because it happened in Game 7, it's you know I see all these Astros fans who are like, yep, uh, they didn't do a good enough job, you know, making sure they had good starting pitching depth. Okay, maybe I'll listen to that. McCullers didn't throw a pitch for him this year. Hunter Brown didn't develop during the season they the way they thought he would. Urquidy missed a lot of the season. They ended up bringing Verlander back into the fold, which was a great move. But, you know, maybe I'll listen to that. They had a lot of injuries throughout the season. They still hosted Game 7 of the ALCS. At the end of the day, they just lost two more games at home. Now, it is weird. I will say this. The home situation for them, sub-500 record during the regular season. Now they've lost two big-time series where neither home team won a game in a series, the 2019 World Series, and now this one in the ALCS. That sort of shit's strange to me. It, it is strange. Um you could, I mean, yeah, you could point to a bunch of different things. Like Framber ha- hadn't been himself, and mm-hmm. yes, Javier didn't get out of the, you know, whatever it was, the first inning or the second inning. I forget now already. First, so much baseball. Uh, but they had everything you needed. They had a bunch of starting pitching. They had a great bullpen. They did have a long lineup. I think you could point to that. The bottom of their lineup didn't really produce. It was very top heavy for them, and that's not typical of an Astros team. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeremy Pena didn't do much. At the bottom of the lineup, a lot of those guys there, the five, six, seven, eight, nine guys, Kyle Tucker starting it off, they didn't produce. And if you go look at the Rangers lineup, you know, a lot of them produced at the bottom mm-hmm. of the lineup. So that's that's a difference. But again, we're talking – what do we say about game sevens, Chris? Like anything can happen. What? It's one game in baseball, dude. Baseball is one of those sports where, like you said, really, truly anything can happen against any given team. The Oakland A's can beat the Rangers, and they did throughout the season. It's like – it can happen. So I again, I think they did everything right, and they just ended up losing one game. At the Two other time. quick things I want to hit on with Houston. Number one is Dusty would not make it official last night. Certainly sounds like he is done, according to several reports out there, including the Athletic. Dusty has been telling good friends that this was going to be it, regardless of how it turned out. If he doesn't return to Houston, how much are they going to miss him? 
I'm not so sure. I, this might be like a negotiating tactic. I'm so like uh, my my ears and my my uh, okay. antennas are perking up a little bit. Um, how big of a deal is it? It's a pretty big deal, uh, you know, because Dusty he sets the tone, and I think that he has been really good for them. And honestly, the Astros like image. Do you remember when he like came in? Like we'll that was this. so good for them. Like because you can't really hate on Dusty. Um, so they're going to miss that a little bit, but if you talk, if you listen or talk to, you know, any of the guys in that clubhouse, like there's a, there's a precedent set, like there is an expectation there and kind of a way they go about things that will continue because they have Altuve, because they have Bregman and Jordan and all these guys that set the tone, like they're still going to be there. So that's the main thing is you still have those guys. They had, they do have some decisions coming up with some of their players, um, but you know, it'll hurt a little bit. It'll hurt a little bit. I think it's going to hurt a lot. I think you made that point that people will tend to forget because a lot of Astro fans just want to talk about his lineup configuration and guys he's pulling out of the bullpen, which I get. I mean, that's what we see in the games. What we don't see is where Dusty really works his magic. Behind the scenes, taking care of guys. When you get yeah. to a city... I've heard this from several people that have played with him. It doesn't seem like that big a thing to just us as regular fans, but I think to ball players, especially veteran ball players, he will tell you at the beginning of a series, "Hey, you're playing on Saturday. You're good tomorrow. The best. Go do thing what it ever when a manager does that. Dude. Go do whatever you need to do. You're off tomorrow. See you Saturday. You're playing Saturday. You're playing Sunday. Be ready for us. And that's a big thing for you guys. Big thing. He treats them like men, like adults, like professionals. And he has handled this thing, for the most part, really, really well. Has he made some mistakes? Of course he's made some mistakes. But, you know, and people are going to say, well, he didn't play McCormick enough. He didn't play Diaz enough. I, I'll listen. I get all that stuff. Very few teams are in line with their manager's decisions, in-game decisions. Very few are like, yep, I trust him implicitly. Terry Francona was getting blasted his last year in Cleveland for the decisions he was making. So, Speaking of your guardians, Stephen Vote, that'd be sick. Yeah, well, that's a little off topic, but it is a little off topic. We'll get to that. But okay. I just hope that you appreciate the situation Dusty came into if he yeah. is indeed done. Last quick thing on Houston Dynasty, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Two World Series, seven straight ALCSs. That's, that's, and with, this is what I think about when I talk about dynasties. Like I feel like you have to have like a core group of players along with it. Mm -hmm. and, and and Jimmy made a good point last night. Like, well, what about college sports? I'm like, that's a little different because you, you like have to leave after a certain point. You just right. can't play anymore. Um, but like, you know, they have that nucleus of guys. They've enjoyed so much success and they won two titles. I think 100% it's a dynasty. And, and it's I not over yet, people. Just FYI. Yeah, I think that the term of dynasty has changed because of the mobility of players now. It just has. I mean, would you rather have Houston's run in which they've made seven straight ALCSs in two World Series or the Giants' run of Houston's. three Worlds? Didn't even let me finish, okay. Houston's, because it's more sustained success. You have a chance seven years in a row to go to the World Series, and you won two. If like Now, if you tell me they won one, I'd probably think, I would lean Giants. I mean, three mm -hmm. rings is awesome. Two rings, it's like you got multiple rings and seven mm -hmm. straight ALCSs. And guess what? Next year, they're probably going to be in the ALCS. Yeah. I, the problem with the discussion we just had, and maybe I'm part of the problem for even bringing it up, is that people want to bash success. They're like, oh, you weren't that good. You weren't a dynasty. I mean, call me when you were a dynasty. You weren't a dynasty. The Braves weren't a dynasty. Like, we're so quick to label things that they have to be as great as this or that or the other thing, or it doesn't matter. I mean, shit, to do what the Braves did throughout the 90s and the early 2000s where they win, whatever, 13, 14 division crowns in a row, or whatever it was. Yeah, but they only won one world championship. Astros. Well, they only won two over seven years. Shit, think about that. For the people who have never won one in their lifetime, I don't care what you want to call it. You can call it a dynasty, no dynasty shit. I will take it. Well, they cheated in 27. Okay. All right. I get it. Facts. Facts. Well, I. it's all part of the discussion. And if that's the reason you want to hold the dynasty talk against them, 
So be it. If that's the way you want to look at it. They still won the World Series. They didn't have to give the banner back. They didn't have to give their rings back. No, they did not. They definitely did not. Today's edition of Baseball Today, presented by our friends over at Mova Globes. What's a Mova Globe? It's one of these bad boys. It's poetry in motion. It's powered by ambient light. Hidden magnets, they provide movement. So what does that mean? There's no batteries. There's no cord. You just set this baby by the windowsill, open those shades, let Mother Nature shine through, and this thing will spin and create yeah. a peaceful feeling. It's powered by ghosts, actually. That's what they say. <laughs> Go, a ghost is spinning it the whole time. They're, we're trying to sell this thing. It's Look available thing. in over 40 designs, including sports, world maps, outer space, famous artwork, and much, much more. And they're an official MLB partner, so MOVA is proud to present the unique baseball memorabilia. It's perfect for both classic baseball collectible enthusiasts and devoted fans. As of right now, there's a half dozen baseball teams available, including the Dodgers. I'm holding that here. The Cubs, the Giants, the Astros, the Red Sox, the Yankees. That's all available right now. But next season, all 30 teams, including the American League champion Texas Rangers, will be available. So enjoy 10% off officially licensed MLB MOVA Globes when you use the code BT10. That is BT10. Go order your Globes now with the link in the description. You will feel at peace. Namaste. Texas Rangers will find out their dance partner in the World Series. Later today, it is Game 7 between the Diamondbacks and the Phillies in the city of brotherly love. Merrill Kelly weaved his magic through five innings, didn't want to get taken out by his skipper, threw a little hissy fit in the dugout, which I certainly appreciated, but that bullpen slammed the door shut those final four innings. We got ourselves a game seven. Two and two. And he struck him out. Harper chases the curveball, and Merrill Kelly, he is becoming a story here in game six. I just feel like those early runs – let us exhale a little bit. It's an elimination game for us. We know what's at stake. Uh, we knew we had to do, and we were, we were in the middle of doing it. And I think we just started to relax a little bit and we just continue to capitalize throughout, throughout the course of the day. The dulcet tones of Torrey Lavello right there. Can you believe that after losing the first two games in Philly, the way the Phillies were swinging the bat, we are now looking at a game seven? I cannot believe it. I cannot. I really can't. Going down 0-2, and then you know we're looking at their starters and a bullpen game and, and all these things, and here we are. They just played good baseball, man. They really have. And mm-hmm. and and when they've needed to shut uh, the Phillies' offense down, like when down in crunch time, they've done it. The guy pitching tonight fought, had a really good start against him. I think it was five innings pitched, no runs, nine Ks, which is nuts. Um, but no, I I I mean, I get you give you can give them credit. You know, at the beginning of the series, uh, you know, we thought, yeah, maybe there's a chance. But when they went down 0-2, I think everybody jumped shit, man. And they've just been able to stay together, uh, kind of rally around each other, if you will. And, and like, just do it. They've just done it. And they forced a game seven. And we just said this about uh, Rangers, Astros. Anything can happen in one game. I think if you really look at what's going on, the Phillies are the better team. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but you have to go out and win on the field and you have to, you know, figure things out during the games, make adjustments, do all these things. And they've been able to do that and put themselves in a position to be one win away from the world series, which is just, it's an awesome story. It really is like, that's, it's a true, true underdog story because really the Phillies are, you know, Coming back from the World Series last year, they have all these superstars on their team, um, like like so many people that there's probably five or six people on the Phillies that you would mention before you even knew, like popularity rankings, maybe like six, seven, eight people on the Phillies before you knew the first yeah. guy on the D-backs. But here we are, one game for it all, man. I love it. So I would say there's two things here. Number one, I don't know if you saw Tommy Pham's post-game interview yesterday. I did not. I mean, it was Tommy Pham to a T. He was pissed. He was pit. He was like, I got benched. I got benched in game five. And Tori's like, well, you know what? I, 
He calls it a benching. I just wanted him to grab a mental breather. <laughs> Fam's like, motherfucker benched me. And he took it out on Arenola and the Phillies and set the tone. We talked all show Monday about how important it was that Arizona at least get through the first inning where it was scoreless. It didn't matter if they scored necessarily in the first, but to at least not be down after one inning was huge for them. Merrill Kelly did such a nice job with that, although it got a little dicey. And then Tommy Pham puts him on the board. And man, there's so, he's a really polarizing guy, right? I think if he if he's on your team, you're like, okay, we need that intensity. We love that. I even talked to Paul Seawald about him. I said he he seems as polarizing a player as we've got in this sport. I said, what is he? Is he intense leader or is he an asshole? He's like, listen, you don't have to be best friends with everybody, but that dude outworks everybody. He is always prepping. He knows himself. He wants to get better. And he was ready. That was a big deal, I thought, number one. Yeah, to get to uh to get on the board first. We talking about all throughout the playoffs how important that is, especially if you're the road team. Um, so yeah, it was great for him and Guriel going back to back, you know, kind of like shutting that park up a little bit, which we've talked about the intensity of the fans there. I think we got to give a lot of credit to Merrill Kelly. I, I haven't watched all of his starts this year. I'm sure they've watched him pitch quite a bit. I think that was like he had some of his best stuff of the year mm-hmm. in crunch time against the Phillies lineup. Uh he his pitch mix was nasty. If you go check out what he threw, I think he didn't throw, he threw six different pitches. Uh, none of them over 20% and nothing under 9%. Like it was, it was a master class in changing speeds, uh, sequencing, tunneling. Everything was working for him. And I love that he didn't want to come out of the game at 90 pitches after mm-hmm. five innings. Uh, but Tori has shown that he's going to do that no matter what. He's like riding by his decisions. Um, but I think Merrill Kelly deserves a crazy amount of credit for how he pitched last night, too. Yeah. I mean, I was getting on uh, X and screaming like, I cannot believe that he's taking him out after striking out Schwarber and Harper. And now you still need 12 outs from that bullpen, which has been overworked throughout the playoffs. Like, I was thinking, God, you get a guy another 15 pitches, he gets you another three outs, he's rolling. He was, he was rolling. He was rolling and ended up working out great for Tory. And he obviously knows his team pretty well, so this one worked out. So let's spin it ahead to tonight. Game seven, the pitcher of all pitchers in the postseason, Ranger Suarez going against the kid, Brandon Fott. And I suppose let's start with Fott because he has had fantastic back-to-back playoff starts against the Dodgers and now the Phillies. How confident are you he can make it a trifecta? I don't know. I'm I'm like kind of confident and also kind of scared for him. Uh, if you go back to his baseball savant page, he only has one pitch that has a positive run value. That's his sweeper. And he showcased that last game against the Phillies. But he also had a bunch of fastballs that were getting swung through. Uh, he threw 32 four-seam fastballs, which, by the way, has had like a negative 10 run value this year. It's not, it hasn't been a good pitch for him, but last start it was. Uh, He got 18 swings and nine whiffs on the four seam fastball. If they can't hit the fastball at the top of the zone again, and he's got the the sweeper working, those two pitches right there can get him through against this lineup. If they make the adjustment and they're able to either lay off that high fastball or get on top of it, change the plane of their swings. It could be a long night for Fott. So it's it's going to be about the adjustments made. And again, that is why baseball is so beautiful. You know, it's not like Fott's just better than the Phillies and he's going to dominate them again or vice versa. It's about the, the chess match, man. Like he's not going to come out and throw the same way he did last start. Uh, he might try to and see if it works and then he'll make the adjustment and Phillies hitters are going to have to make an adjustment as well. And it's who can make the better adjustment. Bottom line. So my confidence level, I'm going to rate my confidence level because you guys love when I give numbers. So one through 10, how confident am I that he's going to have a, a similar start uh, to his last against the Phillies? I'll say a four. That's yeah. not very confident. Okay, let's let's play the over-under game. Is Brandon fought? Will he deliver a pitch in the fourth inning? Oh, shoot, man. A good line. Uh in the fourth inning. Oh, it'd be a bad night 
if he didn't get into the fourth inning. Fourth it, inning, it, means bad night. He, but yeah, yeah, but but similar to Jordan Montgomery, Zach Wheeler is available. You mean Zach Gallon? Zach Gallon. Zach Wheeler. Oh, Zach uh, and, and Zach Wheeler. Sorry. Yes. Yes, but Zach Gallon be will be available. So that's – I think he's going to be pitching – I think he will pitch well enough to warrant a fourth inning pitch. I don't know if he's going to get there, though, because Torrey might just yank him. Yeah. Here's a li- here's just a little thing to keep in mind. The National League has one less day to prepare for the World Series. Okay, that's a big deal. Avaldi's going to get game one. For the Rangers. The Phillies, if they don't use Wheeler, will use Wheeler. And if they don't use Gallon, will use Gallon on Oh, I think they'll use Wheeler no matter what. First game's on Friday. If he pitches tonight, just a couple pitches. So, yeah. So this is his side day. Side and, day, yeah. And even though it's a game and it's more amped up and it the juices are really flowing, he still should be able to recover in time for Friday. I think so. Okay. All right. Depends I, how much I he's going to pitch there. I don't know if he pitches five innings and no. Well, right, he can't. He won't go if he pitches five innings. But if he pitches like Montgomery did, if he pitches two plus, maybe, maybe Montgomery only threw thirty-one pitches. Yeah, I know, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what's going to be great. All right, let's play the Zach game. Ooh. The number of Zacks that pitch is set at one and a half. Over. I think both of them get in the game today. Do you really? Why God, wouldn't you? So. I mean, you have these guys at your disposal for 30 pitches. I think if you're looking at your lineup card and you're like, okay, where are my best pitchers? Oh, they're right here and I got 30 pitches. You're going to use them. In a game seven, I think no matter what, something like those guys are pitching. That's awesome. I'm in. I want to see it. I think Fott does not throw a pitch in the fourth. Dude, if he looks like he did last, like he, they were. I know, but I don't. First of all, missing. Okay, I don't expect that to happen. Yeah, I I don't expect that to happen, which means that I think he gives up at least two runs. If he gives up at least two runs, I think he'll be gone. I think they'll turn it over. Could you imagine? This would be like an All Star game where it's Zach Allen and Zach Wheeler, both of them coming in in like the fourth or fifth. Now pitching Zach or, Allen, or, he's had a great or, year for like, the time. Or. If you're the Phillies and you're just like, all right, like maybe Zach closes the game out, like that, oh. I don't know. All him... this is this is where I get excited is when stuff like that happens. You're making these starters get into yes. different roles, like kind of uncomfortable roles. Are you the guy that we think you are, and you can pitch anywhere? Are you just the freaking ball player, or do you have to have your routine set down pat? I love the guys that can say, "Give me the ball. I don't care when, where, who's up. Let me do my thing." That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we get out of here, a uh, quick reminder about our Seeky question of the week. Get that in on our social media channels at Chris Rose Sports. We've been giving away a thousand dollar credit to use on SeatGeek. That is a big deal if we use your question on Friday's show. So please get it in by really Thursday afternoon. That's very helpful for those of us that plan the show. You're just they just need to tweet us the question, X us the question. Yeah, just tweet us the any question. hashtags. No hashtags. Just go. Yeah. You'll see the you'll see the Seeky question of the week for a thousand dollars credit on Seeky, you know and then you can put it in under that hit the reply and just put it in on x that's the best way to to do it formerly twitter okay dan rourke says he will put it in the description so you can just click that link it'll take you right there perfect who will be playing the texas rangers friday in arlington i have the phillies winning the world series so i'm going to continue to say the phillies me too I'll go with them. I think it would be a really fun series. I'm just looking forward to game seven. I love baseball. I like more games. We got as many games as we could in the LCS. So thank you. For our one-of-a-kind producer, Dan Rourke, and the uber-talented Trevor Plouffe, I am Chris Rose. We will see you Wednesday on Baseball Today.